All right, I hope this lives up to everybody's expectations of it. Uh, most of this is gonna be storytelling about my day job versus my night job and the stories and lessons that I've learned from living history, uh, quilting history that really apply to cyber. And I hope that it helps you find synergies in your own uh, hobbies, lifestyles and other things to learn these lessons and move forward. So how living history and quilting made me a better cybersecurity professional. So uh, I'm Mia Clift by day. I've been in IT and cybersecurity for 26 years. Some days I wonder how long it, how it's been that long, but here we are. Um, currently I'm principal executive advisor in cyber risk engineering for Liberty Insurance. And uh, that means that I get to advise CISOs on what's going on in their infrastructure, but I also get to evaluate insureds for their security posture to make uh, our underwriters informed about whether or not they're a decent risk to insure. Uh, in the future, we're hoping to be able to be partners with our insureds, so that's super fun. It's an amazing job I love every day. Um, it's exhausting. It's only been about eight months. Some days it feels like five minutes, some days it feels like five years. Uh, outside of that, I'm also a mentor for Cyversity, which is an organization that supports underrepresented communities in cyber. I teach a GRC class for them, and I lead their mentorship program as a mentor advocate. I also am a mentor for ISACA and WESIS. Uh, as I said, I teach governance, risk, and compliance. I'm a presenter and a writer, uh, and I'm passionate about improving the cybersecurity posture of businesses of all sizes, whether it's small, medium, large. I'm specifically passionate about a critical infrastructure space. My previous role was in water and wastewater, and boy, do I have stories. But by night, I eschew all technology. Since 2000, I've been a living history participant, participating mostly in 1745 to the 1812. I forget that uh, things happened in this country between 1840 and 1870. I like to say that I was hanging out with Queen Victoria in England at that time, can't imagine why. Um, and then I jump for it, I do uh, a little bit of Victor Edwardian and I do uh, auxiliary territorial service in Britain because they were women with motorcycles and that's freaking epic. So that's my living history background. My primary role when I lived on the East Coast, I live in Minnesota now, uh, was of an 18th century surgeon. Uh, I also took my greyhounds and did an organization called Historic Hounds. So we would get go and talk about the history of greyhounds in uh, the world, specifically in the 18th century because George Washington had them, uh, Braddock had them, uh, von Steuben took his during the American Revolution campaign up and down the East Coast. He was at Valley Forge. So my greyhounds and I got to go have parties. Um, I also am a collector and restorer of antique sewing machines. Uh, as you can see in my photo there, I'm an antique quilt collector. I'm also a quilter. I hand quilt, I do hand piecing, and I do machine piecing. Uh, I'm also studying. I'm a journeyman quilt appraiser. I took my quilt appraisal classes this year. Now I'm appraising to become a master appraiser and certified in a few years. That's my retirement career when I'm tired of looking at cyber postures. <laughs> Oops, go back. So the reason I put this presentation together is not just because I like talking about quilts and history all day, because that's super fun, but also because all of your lived experiences can contribute to your cyber role and really all of your career roles. Every, every lived experience that you have can be a story it can be a lesson that you can apply to what you're doing, and it can bring humanity to any of the presentations and any of the discussions that you're having with your teams, with your leadership, even with educating your next generation, even just looking at what is going on in my cyber world and how do I explain it in a way that people are going to get. One of the things that I consider one of my greatest advantages, and I take this from my living history practice and talking to the public is, is two things. One. Analogies are amazing and I do a lot of them, but also you have to learn to read your audience. There are going to be people who want to come and learn all the little nitty gritty bits about everything in the history of everything. And then there's going to be the person who comes up to you and is like, where's the alcohol? Cause I want to get drunk before you operate on me. And then you have to do a very brief explanation that alcohol was considered a stimulant in the 18th century. And then they get bored and wander off because you've ruined their mystique and they just want to go because their kids are here and there's food or something. So you have to learn to address your audience in that way. And by reading the room, and by doing that in living history and all my other backgrounds, I've been able to apply that to my life. And I hope that in doing these lessons today, you'll take away some lessons that maybe are, are valuable to you as well. So the rule number one of history 
and I'm gonna I'm gonna say it a little bit more crass. Uh, if it ain't primary source, it's crap. To use uh, the Saturday Night Live thing about if it ain't Scottish, it's crap. Um, you need primary source documentation. Anybody can tell you anything. My great grandmother made this quilt. My great grandmother didn't make this quilt. But somebody will tell you that to make a buck. Somebody will tell you a story to get you engaged. Somebody will tell a story to sell a historic site or sell tickets and all that kind of stuff. It's not always true. So the image on the screen is records um, for the pension office for the War of 1812. My seventh great grandfather was named Thornton and his obituary in the Staunton newspaper in Virginia says celebrated veteran of the War of 1812. Now, as a 1812 living history person, I was like, this is great. I can join, like, maybe I can join the Sons of the American Revolution or the Daughters of the American Revolution. And because I had a, a, a War of 1812 person, maybe his kid was in it and I can do some genealogy. So we, we, dug some, we did some digging and we found the pension papers. There's 42 pages of documentation here that basically says that my great, 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 great grandfather served six days. So he was ineligible for a pension. So again, while everybody was like, oh, he did this great thing. He fought in the War of 1812. He, he, went to, he went out to a militia muster for six days and was like, yeah, I'm done here. So primary source is imperative to verify that information that you have heard or that information that you are curious about. And that applies to cyber in that trust but verify mentality. Anybody can tell you anything about their network but if you don't have proof in the pudding, it doesn't exist. When I was doing GRC, one of my greatest examples was, you know, you can tell me that aliens are guarding your server room, but unless I see the men in black show up and take, you know, take pictures of your little green men outside, it doesn't exist. You can tell me anything. You can tell me you have MFA everywhere, but if I don't actually see evidence of that MFA, it doesn't exist. And that's a challenge sometimes because it's hard to actually quantify and, and visualize some of the things that we have, but that goes back also to being authentic with each other. And you can do that through your personal and, and also just saying, you know, I understand not everything is gonna be accurate. You're not gonna have all the answers to everything. That goes back to you try to do the best you can with primary source, but always trust, but verify. Lesson two, folklore and urban legends can be both helpful and hurtful. So on the screen, I have two things. There's a, uh, there's a 50 caliber lead bull, bullet and a caltrop. So I'm gonna talk about the bullet, not as much about the caltrop. Caltrops are fun, but a longer story. Um, there is a urban legend and it was popularized by Hollywood that when you had surgery in the 18th century because you didn't have anesthesia, uh, that you would bite a bullet while they were operating on you. And so without fail, I have tons of people who would come up to me and be like, where's the bullet for me to bite on? Again, it goes, in, it goes hand in hand with where's the bottle of whiskey. Um, the reality is that there's some truth to that. They found lead bullets in North Carolina around some battlefields that had tooth marks on them. But the reality of medicine, and this is the reality of humans, if say you had a lead ball in your mouth and you were biting down on it and somebody immediately punches you in the chest or cuts you on something. What do you do? You suck in a deep breath and you swallow. So then you're choking. And we don't have the Heimlich maneuver for a few more years. So you're gonna die on that table. What the reality is, is that in North Carolina you have wild boars. Wild boars like the taste of lead. Wild boar teeth look a lot like human molar imprints. So the, the hypothesis running now amongst historians and archeologists is that the bullets that they found were eaten by pigs not bit down on for surgery. So if you ever see that, you go, eh, about that. I talked to a person who studied this long and hard. Um, and so really what it was was a stick. So if you've ever seen the movie Master and Commander, they were probably the most historically accurate in doing surgery at that time. And it's also a great movie, highly recommend it. The cyber equivalent here is that the truth is always stranger than fiction. How many of us have that no shit there I was story? I have several, I know. You guys all have them. And so we can tell stories that are scarier and stranger than the stuff that's coming out. And the example that I have here is, you know, the Wi-Fi toothbrushes that were going to be bot botnetted and taken over the world. The reality was is that that was a thought experiment by a company that got released and then fear mongered across the world. 
Fear mongering isn't the way to get people to move in the right direction. It just worries people and then they're like, I'm never going to do anything ever. What you have to do is say, yes, there is a threat of botnets because of IoT. Your toothbrush is probably not going to be the biggest concern that we have. So again, use the truth to your advantage. Use those urban legends to educate, but also educate that there's a bit of distrust within that. And I mean, there's tons of urban legends that I could talk about all day, especially when you get into quilting too. But this is this is some of the primary ones that I dealt with on a regular basis. I mean, my parents called me about the toothbrush thing and I'm like, you don't even have Wi-Fi toothbrushes. Why are you worrying? But, 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 no, don't move on. Lesson three, you have to understand the bigger picture to see the whole story. So this quilt that's on the screen is this quilt that is here. This quilt was made in around 1840, probably in Pennsylvania. But if you look at this quilt, all of the diamonds are the exact same size. Every single diamond out of this piece is the exact same size. The other part of it is you can see it looks really cool. It looks almost chaotic in its own right. But if you step back, it's got five or six different, oh my God, um, five or six different uh, patterns within it. And these are the kinds of quilts that I like. I call them organized chaos because you can see a habit within them and you can see uh, some really cool patterning. Yes. Hi. Hi. So I, uh, in case uh, folks don't know, we have this thing called outrageous speaker requests here at B-Sides. And when you, you know, several months ago, fill out your, uh, your presentation uh, submission, uh, you, you put down I don't know, all green M&Ms or whatever, right? So uh, I believe you made a request for a signed photograph or a cameo with Sebastian. Yes. And uh, <laughs> technically, any signed photograph of anything signed by anyone <laughs> would satisfy that request. Fair. Um, Anybody named Sebastian, fine. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we I decided to kind of combine the two. You get to have a cameo with Sebastian or rather... Holy He's gonna have a cameo with you <laughs> during your talk. What? What? And it is it is signed. <laughs> oh <my> Damn it! <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> and I then, hate you so bad right now because you knew about this. <laughs> oh my and god! And then as a bonus, <laughs> we got you. You a did not. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> my god thank you so much you're very welcome where would you like this right there it's okay. fine <laughs> sebastian stan the winter soldier i have a kind of crush does anybody have something slightly heavy i could put on this <laughs> um yeah he was he was the winter soldier in the marvel series bucky barnes he's also he was on uh once upon a time and some other stuff, but those are the big ones. Thank you for speaking. Oh my god, you didn't have to do the cameo. Holy shit, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I don't, what am I? <laughs> okay, so side, side story really quick, because we have the minute. Um, I went to London and uh, I got to see uh, the guy who played Admiral Palu in a stage production. Uh, uh, he was in the Horatio Hornblower series, and that was when I was doing 1812 and Napoleonic. And I went to the side door to say hello, and I was like, oh, I'm going to see something really cool, and he's going to invite me out to a pub, and we're going to have great history discussions. And the only thing I said was, a whole bunch of reenactors in Washington, D.C. think you're super cool. And he looked at me and he was like, oh, thanks. And like signed my playbook and then left. And I was like, that was the most embarrassing thing. So I'm totally going to embarrass myself in about five minutes or whenever this cameo happens. So thank you so much. <laughs> All right, so back to quilting. Um, so you have to understand the bigger picture to see the whole story. And this is very apparent in cyber. You can't just say everything is locked down. You have to see everything. You have to understand the whole story. While somebody can check every box and say, we're completely secure, I, I know you're lying. Not everybody is completely secure. It's, it goes back to another story. Um, in my last job, we were setting up a monitoring solution for our OT environment. 
And uh, the leader of that team went to his engineer, who I was talking to regularly, and he goes, so once we have this monitoring solution, we're done with security, right? Because he thought that that was just all he needed. That was the one part of the picture that was going to solve all their problems. We can't do that. That's not the reality. So um, you really do have to see the whole picture to enjoy the story. And then you get lost in the story. So, you know, realizing that the back of this quilt was made in the, around 18, you know, 1840, the back is Pennsylvania because Pennsylvania likes colors on their backings where most places didn't and things like that. So you, you learn and, and find more stories and then you find more rabbit holes to go down to learn more about your environment and where you want to go next and how you want to improve. Lesson four, there's always more than meets the eye. So this is my absolute favorite quilt in my collection. I call it Organized Chaos. It was made in Western Pennsylvania around 1860. So it looks chaotic, doesn't it? Like it's hard to look at, but you have to look closer. So you see all of the peonies. So those are the red flower looking ones. And then next to them, there are Lemoyne stars, which are the star blocks. And then on the diagonal, you have pinwheel blocks. So this quilter, without being able to put up a design wall to see all of this stuff from a distance, was able to figure out this whole image. And every time I look at it, I see a new aspect of the quilt and a new complexity. So I call it organized chaos because it is organized. And honestly, to me, it looks like a garden in the fall where the leaves have fallen around the flowers. So in that quilt, I know a lot of people who wouldn't buy that quilt because they don't understand it. How many environments have you been in or how many organizations have you talked to or how many cyber environments have you worked in that were chaotic, but you could see the beauty within, you could see the pattern and you could see how it all played together. And sometimes it did look chaotic on the outside, but on the inside, it's beautiful. The other lesson, and this is one of my favorites, especially as I've dealt in the OT space, everything old is new again. So doing 18th century medicine, Everybody talks about bloodletting and leeches. Um, leeches were not as commonly used as you would think. Most of the time they were used on the in, infirm of children or on sensitive areas like your eyes, um, your ears and your toes. But to that end, I did have pet leeches for a time. Uh, Sippy, Gulpy and Glugger. Um, I had to go to a local butcher shop and get blood for them about every three months so that they would eat. Uh, and they were wonderful. They swam around. Uh, two of them ended up escaping. <laughs> and disappearing until I moved out of the house that I was in. And one of them lived a very long life because I took care of him. The thing about it is leeches are now being used in medicine today. So um, they're not being used to take blood away. What they're doing is they're using the leeches for reattachment surgery. So in the saliva of a leech, there's an anticoagulant. So if you put that on a, a reattached limb, and let them start sucking blood, they actually recalibrate the circulation. So they bring blood flow back to things like ears, noses, and fingers. And there's such a great success with it. There's actually a company called Leeches USA that supplies all of med medicinal leeches. You personally can also buy from leeches.biz at $8 a pop with a $25 flat shipping. But that's the thing, everything old is new again. The PLC on the left was built in 1975. That was the first PLC my father ever built. He tells me it's probably still in operation. In the middle, we have a gopher terminal. One of the things I tell new cybersecurity people is if you want to understand networking, go to gopher because you have to do it menu based and you have to know how to get around networks point to point to point, which is routing at its most basic form. Today, all of our routing happens automatically. It's rare that we see some, you know, we see a down detector because of a DDoS attack. But I remember back in the day, this is me being old, you know, we had to route everything around the internet. So um, we still have that. And then of course in OT environments, we still have Windows XP, Windows 95. I heard uh, a colleague of mine tell me that uh, she was told that there's Windows Home on her network currently. So, you know, everything old still exists. My oldest quilt in my collection is made in 1816. So everything old is new again. People are starting to come back to quilt revivals as well. People are getting back into history and we're learning new things even while dealing with those legacy pieces. And the final lesson is there's always more to learn. So 
This picture is from a 1910 book that Singer put out called Singer's Instructions for Lacework and Art Embroidery. That is embroidery on a piece of veneer. This is my new challenge because I found it in the book and I was like, there's no way. So uh, when I leave here, I'm going to the Virginia Quilt Museum to demonstrate treadle embroidery and I'm going to be doing embroidery on veneer. But that's the thing is there's always new things. I got that book and I was just looking at it for the thread painting and the lace work. And then I opened up chapter 90 and buried around wood. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. But it's a new rabbit hole to fall down. And in technology, everything's changing. Even if it's not changing, there's always a new rabbit hole to fall down. If you would have told me five years ago, I would be where I am. Or even three years ago that I would be learning about OT and going to my dad and being like, explain PLCs better for me. I would have told you you're crazy. But here we are. And who knows what rabbit holes I'll fall down tomorrow. And I hope you fall down rabbit holes too. Thank you so much. If you like history and you like quilts and textiles and you want to see more about the things that I do that way, you can find me on uh, Facebook at History by Hand. Um, you can find me on uh, LinkedIn. And I also have a database project called the FeedSack Project that's cataloging. Um, feed sacks from 1935 to 1965 that are printed colorways, about 20,000 of them. So feel free to do that. Are there any questions? All right. Thank you so much. <laughs>